All right. Well, uh, it's so wonderful to be here. Um, and uh, I really wanted to start by thanking the Buddhist Geeks uh, conference organizers, and especially Vince and Kelly, um, for allowing or giving Shinzen and I the opportunity to geek out with you all today, really. Um, it's just so wonderful. Um, and also for providing this uh, really progressive forum for uh, dialoguing about cutting-edge science of mind. And that's where we're sort of starting. So let's see here. We can move forward. Oh. So just as mapping the human genome greatly stimulated research at both basic science levels and uh, had created a myriad of clinical applications, mapping the meditative mind is an initiative that holds great promise for getting to understand the mind at a really rich level in the intersection between modern psychology, neuroscience, philosophy, and the contemporary Dharma movement. And so what I hope to demonstrate today is what the landscape in the mind of a meditator, of an expert meditator, really, uh, may look like across networks of brain uh, functioning and how we're beginning to map out mindful awareness using Shinsen's basic mindfulness system. Um, so I also will challenge you a little bit uh, today. Uh, I'm going to ask you to uh, leave this room with nine bits of information. Okay? So if you leave this room and you're like, what were the nine bits? Then, then come to our meeting uh, later so we can make sure you have those nine bits. Okay? So four, four systems of self-processing that are modulated by mindfulness-based meditation practices. And this is great because Gary sort of set up some of the systems that I'll be talking about. Um, and uh, we may disagree a little bit about why the narrative self may be important or not important, but I think we can agree that uh, we spend a lot of time hanging out there, for sure. Um, and then the five points that I want you to remember are five salient data points that came from our research study. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we create this map? Well, um, I am uh, part of a functional neuroimaging laboratory. Uh, if you can just click on the little animation there, it's always nice to see. Um, and what we, what we do is we're a team of, of interdisciplinary research investigators at uh, Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital um, that use an approach called neurophenomenology. And this approach is focused on combining fMRI and first-person self-report. So we can get a, a sense of what's going on in the mind of a medita meditator and to clarify the nature of mind in a comprehensive way. Okay? So in order to begin constructing this map of neurophenomenology, uh, we've, be, we've constructed conceptual models, and that's where we started. And we use these conceptual models to dismantle many of the cognitive and psychological processes uh, that are going on in these mindfulness-based uh, meditation practices, um, and they have an underlying neurobiological framework. And so if you're interested in what we, what we created in terms of the, the systems and the, the processes and the neurobiological framework that we set up, then you can just check out these two um, uh, references and one that's most recently and that will be published uh, very soon in Annals of Your Academy of Sciences. Okay, so what else have we done? We start, we've begun to test these models in meditation practitioners, um, and most importantly, we have focused on the spectrum of experience uh, across experience and proficiency in these meditators, right? So this is sort of, uh, this level of analysis speaks to the metaphor that, that Ken Folk was talking about, yeah, Kenneth Folk was talking about yesterday, this, contempl this idea of contemplative fitness, right? So we really want to understand what happens as you move from a novice practitioner, okay, all the way through uh, to expertise and uh, as, you, as the meditator flexes the mental muscle, what's going on? What's changing in the brain? Not just taking a slice of meditators, you put them all in the same scanner and you say, in five minutes, meditate, and we want to know what happened. No, we want to know what's going on throughout from the, from the point zero where you start meditation for the first time all the way to people who have been doing this for 11,000 hours of practice at least. Right? And what's important, what you'll t one of the take-home messages here is that you'll see that there's differences in the brain, across this spectrum. And that's something we need to be really clear about. Okay. Um, so, um, what have we, so what have we really done here? First, first sort of 
uh, or study to do this was a collaboration that with Shinzen That was meant Yang. to be a joke. I hope you understand. We were, <laughs> we were trying to look like mad scientists. That's right. So these are, these are the mad, mad scientists. Or demented. <laughs> right. But I should emphasize, we're not really tied to any or wedded to any particular meditation practice or model in particular. We just happen to think that Shinzen's basic mindfulness system is really well articulated for these purposes. Um, but he will go into a little bit more on his system and how this fits into the overall big picture um, after me. So we have this map that we're constructing um, and attempts to test our models and begin to identify the critical neural elements and the relationship between those elements right, in specific forms of meditation that cultivate mindful awareness. Um, and such a map can be used as a diagnostic tool, um, uh, for navigation of progress by the practitioner, which some people are already using. So uh, Gary referred to a friend and colleague of mine, Judd Brewer. I'll mention him another time. And he's using real-time feedback to sort of give progress, to allow the, the practitioner to assess where they are. And also for targets for therapeutic purposes. So I'm in the Department of Psychiatry, and this is going to be incredibly helpful for identifying how it, what a flourishing mind looks like. Okay, that's really important. So another aspect, uh, important aspect of our map is to determine where in the brain we should start looking for transformation. And the clearest answer has really been to uh, start with a sense of self, right? The experience of me across moments of self-processing. And so we have identified uh, uh, four systems of self-processing that happen across the moments of time. And moments of, of me can really refer to perception and cognition. So there's a lot of things happening in the time scale is everything that's happening at the non-conscious level to more evaluative sort of systems, right? So what are these four systems? Remember I said nine, nine pieces of information, right? So here's four. We're going to start with four. Now I'm going to start showing you pictures of brains, and I don't want to be scared. I know some of you may not have familiarity with, with brains, but I will try to be very <laughs> colorful in the way I describe them. It could be taken in various ways. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think he meant functional neuroanatomy. Functional neuroanatomy. Don't pay attention. <laughs> Don't pay attention so much to the little abbreviations inside the brain. It's not as important, but I gave colors. Pay attention to the colors, and each color represents a system, a network, all right? So the first system is this narrative self system that Gary just set it up beautifully. So I think you should have a clear sense of what that system is. It's also referred to as the default mode network. And that's because we spend the majority of our time there, right? Okay, so that's a, a whole bunch of brain areas. One of the brain areas he pointed out happens to be the, the, the two nodes, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and the posterior cingulate cortex. And that's very much a, a very strong part of this network. And it'll, it'll make sense when we talk about the data um, soon, okay? Another system is the experiential self system. And so we're going to start adding layers to this, okay? And so the experiential system is kind of an off kind of... P like yellow, I guess, in this color. Um, but it's uh, the experiential system. And this is the I, the now, the sensory. But it's also actually a little bit involved with areas involved with working memory. So how do you keep the sensation that you're experiencing in the moment, right now? You're keeping it in your mind. There is an aspect of keeping that sort of sensory experience in your mind in the moment. And that's an aspect of working memory. It involves some of these lateralized networks that Again, Gary pointed out by a colleague and friend of mine, Norm Farb, he showed that you can make a difference between narrative and the experiential, right? So, okay, so there's two networks. Uh, another one is the non-conscious self-system, okay? This is the stuff that's going on under the hood, so to speak. These are the non-conscious sensory affective motor processing. This is the embodied action of you interacting with the world. What's, how your body, that it, it, it sort of defines the, the, the self-processing as you interact with the world, Right? It's the action tendencies. It's the motivational drive and intention that, that creates your behavior. Okay? Automatized cognition, the habits of mind that you're used to just doing is located in this network. And this is, these are in the blue structures. Okay? Um, and then we have an integrative control system. And it's in orange. And this area... This network seems to be really critical in terms of meditation practitioners because what it helps to do is integrate information coming from the exterior and the in internal environment. It's also really involved in controlling cognition in a very top-down way, not necessarily suppressing the uh, other parts of the brain, but actually integrating information much more efficiently. So 
the most important point you want to take from this system is that it flex, allows you to flexibly switch between all the other aspects of self-processing. That means that you can get move voluntarily with, I believe, free will, between a narrative... <laughs> I am a cognitive neuroscientist and I somewhat believe in free will. I don't have like, good uh, evidence for, for there being a, something otherwise, but I'm open to anything. But there is a way that you can flexibly switch. You know when you're in the narrative. To know that you're in the narrative allows you to switch. And that meta-awareness is something that this integrative network is really good at helping you do. And to provide the meta-awareness you need to know where you are so you can switch. You can sit and stay in your narrative, but be aware that you're in your narrative. And actually, there's some good research to show, and I know a lot of neuroscientists are showing now that the narrative is bad, default mode system is not good for happiness, but there are some data that suggest that being in the narrative actually enhances creativity. Um, so there is some use for being in the narrative, and I, I'll just emphasize that. And, and I'd love to just talk with Gary maybe afterwards about it. <laughs> um, okay, so four systems, right? right? Do you guys remember them now? We've got, we got the narrative, right? You've got the experiential, the non-conscious, and the integrative. Just leave with those four systems, and that's great. But then we'll try to get to the, um, the data, all right? All right, so, uh, what, so what did Shenzhen and I do? Uh, and I, I only, I'm only circling these because actually the anterior insula and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, um, and actually even the ventral lateral prefrontal cortex switch between experiential and integrative. They, they overlap. So these aren't really discrete systems. There is a lot of overlap too. Um, but this is the best way that people have shown that these networks will, will fire together usually uh, and be connected functionally and anatomically um, through different um, studies, okay? All right, so what do we do? Phase one, so here's us in a happy state, standing in the same place, in front of the uh, 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 scanner room, and there's uh, Shenzhen in front of the Harvard Medical School quad. Okay, so what do we do? Um, we took, um, we ended up with 15 adept meditators with a range of experience between 1,000 and 11,000 hours of experience, uh, no current psychopathology, drug abuse, history of structural brain disease, yada, yada, yada. This was really important, though, to do this because we know that a lot of these sort of exclusionary criteria may potentially confound our results. And that's one of the actually pitfalls of doing this type of research is that we need to find meditators that have sort of this clean history and it's quite... <laughs> it was quite difficult. We'll just put it that way. But that's not to say that um, there's value in looking at, at psychopathology history as well. All right. So, uh, all right. So what did, what did we do here? All right. So we used the basic mindfulness system. And here's the, sort of the basic grid. Um, but we wanted to focus on the part of the grid, restful states, that would be particularly interesting uh, comparison to the common baseline resting state that is used in the majority of fMRI studies. And this is where contemplative science has completely revolutionized imaging research because our baseline state has always been, let your mind freely wander without thinking about anything in particular. Now, for most people, that's not a problem. Um, and it's been a pretty effective baseline state. For meditators, it was a little bit of a challenge to ask them to let their mind freely wander. The first, <laughs> the first question that came to mind was, well, where do you want our minds to, to wander to? <laughs> so. In any case, we can talk about those, those difficulties uh, later. But we thought this would give us a really rich, rich amount of data on concentration power in a state of meditative tranquility. So what were, the, what were the states that we were interested in? I'll briefly describe these, and Shenzhen could go into them more in detail later. But see rest was a focus on grayscale blank that replaces mental imagery. Hear rest is focus on the absence of inner speech. A feel rest is focus on visceral somatic relaxation in the body. And do nothing was a form of absolute rest that, that um, if you're familiar with Shinzen's techniques, really uh, describes uh, an effortless sustaining of awareness and clarity of mind without explicit intentional selection. Is there something you want to add to those? Does that sound That's about right? right. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, and I would just say this is my reworking of things like Dzogchen, just sitting, uh, choiceless awareness. So that. that's really important Open to keep in presence. mind. Open there's, presence. There's a whole range of things historically, and I just formulated it in a certain way. Uh, the <clears throat> the um, C rest is uh, reworking uh, 
of uh, the Nimitta and uh, Kasina practices. Um, uh, so I, I guess I would say that. Okay. Well, so this is actually really helpful because when we start to look at the data compared to other people's data, it's important that we have that sort of common language. Uh, the field rest uh, maps onto a quality called prashabdi or pasaddi in the jhanic system, very roughly speaking. So they, they all have historical antecedents. I just sort of modernized the language and reworked it slightly. All right, so that's what we looked at. And what, so what did, what did we do for in terms of the analyses? There's Shenzhen sitting in the scanner. He's all happy coming out after like <laughs> hours of sitting in the meditation scanner testing these, sort of, these models out. So what we did was we contrasted, and, med- and imaging is all about, co- you need a contrast for, for the general linear model is what we usually use, and um, you need a contrast. So we looked at all these different contrasts, and, but what I'm going to focus on for the sake of time the do-nothing contrast, and it seemed to have the most interesting findings. So what MW is, stands for mind-wandering. That's right. So what did they do while well on the scanner? So this box, these colorful boxes here represent all the states uh, that I just described to you, uh, five minutes of meditation time um, uh, interspersed with two and a half minutes of this mind wander state that was a non meditative state. Okay? And during that time, we weren't just interested in what most people do in imaging, is they just average what's going on during each of these blocks. Okay? And averaging is, is the way you know, science works, but um, it's, uh, we were interested in very particular um, aspects of the, of the practice. And what we wanted to do, because this is sort of a neural phenomenon, phenomenological approach, is peak states of clarity, okay? So what they did was they indicated with a finger press when they uh, feel that they've reached a peak state of clarity, also described as clear contact with a particular state in which they're meditating, and that state is intensely present. Okay? So the clarity means a clear contact with see rest, hear rest, or feel. Right. If they um, grossly lost concentration, they were to press with a thumb, a thumb press, and if they were back in, they would indicate with another finger press. And if they went deeper, they would just indicate with another uh, finger press. So we had, this, we had beautiful time marks within the whole 32 and a half minute run. We did four of those runs for each person. And we could then model those particular states. So we can then look at just, just the times that they went into this peak state of clarity, before they went into the clarity, afterwards when there was gross loss of concentration, and these are things that we can do um, from, for, from, for years from now and look at these things. So here's one subject, for example, who uh, had about 6,000 hours of experience. This is uh, one run of 32 and a half minutes or 1,951 seconds, and each six represents a, a, a button press that they were peak state of clarity, um, and a seven indicates when they grossly lost concentration. Okay? And these numbers actually represent the quality in which the practitioner rated that particular run on a scale of 1 to 10. Okay? So that just gives you a sense of what, what they did. So, okay, here's our five salient points. You remember the four systems, and now we're going to give you the five salient points. And I have to give you a caveat. Uh, a Buddhist scholar, a friend of mine, John Dunn, said, you have to make people believe that you're not showing them where enlightenment is in the brain. So here's the caveat that these blobs don't represent the state of meditation directly. They're a representation of the relative activity in each state versus a non-meditative state. So that's the best we can do at this point. Um, we are using other um, very specific um, uh, novel methods instead of the general linear model to look at some of these states. Um, there were some unique states that were experienced in the scanner that we can talk about at the breakout session. Um, and so, um, but this is general linear model. Okay, so let me just navigate you what's going on here. So here's our little diagram of those four systems that we talked about. Here's a brain. <laughs> And it's a sagittal cut, in this case, so right down the middle. And um, I'm going to walk you through each of those five points. The first one I'm going to talk about is the posterior cingulate cortex slash precuneus. It sort of overlaps in the, that boundary. And what you see in this graph, I wonder if this is a, is this a laser pointer? Yes. Uh, the, Maybe. The, you know, I'll just point. At the top of it, there's, a, is it? there's an icon there. I'll just point. Okay, so what you see here is a graph of the 13 meditators that were scanned. They had good data. And um, the percent bowl signal change from baseline. All right? And so what you see on average, really, is on average, what you see is a decrease, and blue represents decrease, of activity in this posterior cingulate cortex. And that's what the Gary was referring to. That means that's one of the nodes in the narrative network. Okay? The narrative network. 
This is one of the major nodes. And you have decreases across most of the practitioners. The interest, so there's a few interesting things here. First of all, let me just say that, again, I'll use the same slide that Gary showed. Is that good friend, good friend, thanks. Good friend of mine, Judd Brewers, showed um, also that there was decreases in this area. And he showed that, um, what he showed basically was that there was decreases in these meditators in this particular brain region at about 0.5% from the baseline. And um, what we showed was not only the same findings, but we went, um, to, they went down to as low as 15% from baseline. So that's pretty significant in intensity and magnitude change. Um, but something that's really interesting that's striking that came about is the meditators that had the most amount of formal sitting meditation practice actually had increases in this area. And so what this means to us is that it may not be relevant to suppress this brain area as you become extremely or much more advanced in, in this particular um, type of practice. Okay, so that's something we need to really think about. Okay, that was number one. Number two, the frontal polar cortex. We showed increases in the right frontal polar cortex. Okay, that's frontal polar, meaning right in the front. It is the most highly advanced part of our brain. It's the most recently evolved part of our brain. Between two and three million years ago, early hominids started to use language, fire, and tools. And if you look at the Australopithecus, I think I have a picture. Let's see. If you look at Australopithecus around that time, this, this guy right here, Sediba, all right, started to have a different cranium, the skull, actually grew in this particular region, making these, the, the sort of relationship between this area, the frontal polar cortex, and what distinguishes us from non-human primates, language, self-reflection, fire use, tool use. That all happened around that time, and that's when the frontal polar cortex developed. It is, happens to be just one of the most highly developed brain areas. And a lot of people don't really know what it's intended for. This one describes it as... Uh, um, uh, selectively mediating human ability to hold in mind goals while exploring and processing secondary goals. Okay? It also has been implicated in meta-awareness, in prospective memory, very higher order cognitive function. And here we are with these meditators showing almost in the top three meditators, almost 60% change in bull response. This never happens in neuroimaging research. In neuroimaging research, you get between 0.5 and 1% bold signal change. That's significant. This is 60%. That's huge. It, and it's not artifact. We're really confident that it's not artifact because there's a very clear relationship with the hours of uh, meditation practice. What's the relationship to the prefrontal cortex? Well, it's part of your prefrontal cortex. It just happens to be the most anterior it's the part. most frontal part. Most frontal. So prefrontal. There's, there's the frontal polar, there's dorsolateral on the side, and there's orbital. So let me just make it clear that ventral medial prefrontal cortex is part of that default mode network. Ventral medial me meaning the, the bottom side and the middle. Okay? That usually goes together with the PCC, the posterior cingulate cortex, with the, the, the narrative self. And that's usually what suppresses limbic system activity for emotion regulation. In this case, what you have is not suppression of the limbic system. You just have focused concentration, equanimity, and clarity going on in these states Right? And it's happening frontal polar and dorsal lateral actually too. So this is point two. Point three, well, I'll tell you about point, point four actually relates more to point three. But, so point three is the striatum. This was also a massive increase, about 10% signal change maximum. But across all practitioners, you had increases in the striatum. This is point three. Right? So what this area is showing that the non-conscious network, and one of the main nodes in the non-conscious network, is the striatum. It's important for skill learning. Okay, skill learning, meaning as you get better at doing something, you, it frees up your resources, your main cognitive resources, to be available to deal with the world. And you just automatize it. And that's what's going on. These, it's suggesting that the meditators are very automatized in their ability to do these practices. It's no longer as effortful, and it's just highly automatic. And it could be related to also this motivational drive, a continuous motivational drive or intention as they continue to do the practice. So very significant finding as well. Okay, number four, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. And this is an experiential network finding. It's keeping your working memory in the moment. This is also related to the experiential network that, that uh, Gary referred to uh, in um, uh, Norm Farb's study. And again, you had a 25% bull signal change. So these increases that we're seeing are massive. I mean, these are, these are all add-ups. So, but it's important that we look across across 
expertise, not just put, them all, put all people together and sort of see what goes on on average. We need to look across expertise. Okay, the last salient point, this is the fifth, and it's sort of five and six, but it sort of goes together because they're part of the limbic system. And what, what I wanted to make clear here is that, that usually, like I said before, the ventral medial prefrontal cortex is an evaluative brain area. We use it a lot. That's our narrative. We need to evaluate the world constantly. And so that brain area typically is suppressing the limbic system because that's a form of regulating our emotion. If we want to suppress emotion reactivity, that one of the biggest researchers in the field, James Gross, talks about suppression, avoidance, reappraisal. These are all cognitive ways of reducing activity in your uh, amygdala and hippocampus. What you have here is a pretty massive decrease in the amygdala and the hippocampus. Here's the hippocampus, and here's the amygdala. Okay, massive decreases there, but not through suppression, through awareness. That's huge. So I'm going to actually be talking about this with James Gross at one of the biggest cogn- uh, Association for Behavioral Cognitive Therapy meeting in November in uh, Tennessee, so because he's showing that you, know, you can regulate the uh, amygdala and hippocampus through suppression and reappraisal, and now we're going to show that you can do it just through awareness. So there's modulation of the limbic system through awareness. Wow. That's a novel finding That's of huge. basic science. No one's shown that. Yeah. Very cool. Okay. All right. So I'm going to just summarize everything. Okay. So here's a lot of pictures of brains. But we have decreases in the narrative networks with the PCC. We have some... Oh, so I'll go back and forth here. So the circles sort of go to the areas. We have increases in the striatum. Okay. And the non-conscious networks. Um, decreases in the amygdala, also part of the non-conscious network. So it's not always just a suppression of non-conscious systems, but in some cases it's important to look at the substrates individually and see how they work. But in general, these are the systems that are, that are affected by the meditation practices. We have uh, great increases in the frontal polar cortex, okay, the integrative network. Um, there's actually part of the anterior medial prefrontal cortex is also part of that network. It's also... Uh, but you can see it up there, very high activity. Also in the left, a little bit. Okay? Um, and uh, some of the inferior parietal lobe area, also part of that network. And then uh, increases in the experiential network. So dorsal lateral prefrontal areas. You've decreased uh, activity in some of the um, uh, um, uh, aspects of the sensory cortex. But in other levels, you have really strong increases in sensory. So there seems to be a really strong focus towards sensory um, experience um, in general, but just more oriented towards focus in this sort of frontal polar area. Okay, so there's sort of the summary, right? There's, there's five points. One was PCC, one was striatum, one was frontal polar cortex, right? The other one was uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, and the last one was hippocampus and amygdala or limbic system. Those are the five, five points, right? So we had nine total. All right, take home message on average meditators show posterior cingulate cortex. Relative decreases, um, however, the highest level of expertise show more activity. Increases in activity in the dorsal striatum, it's part of the non conscious network. This could be related to motivational drive and automated cognition. Mm-hmm. Across levels of experience, expert meditators increase relative activity in the frontal polar cortex and dorsal lateral, showing parts of the integrative and experiential networks, uh, and decreases in relative activity in the limbic system. And so this really provides support for the models that we've been creating, which is great. So so where are we now? So that was phase one for our study with Shenzhen. Um, basic mechanisms, experience meditators. What we need now is really to finish the study, and we're going to compare the results of phase one to the brain changes of novice meditators. And to do this, uh, we're also uh, trying to build a whole contemplative neuroscience research program at Brigham Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And that's, I think that's one of the most important things that we're trying to do. Um, I, I feel committed to, to bringing you know, these types of practices and these contemplative wisdom traditions to mainstream hospitals like Harvard Medical School and Brigham Women's Hospital, and I really hope that we can do that. So we, can, we are looking for, for, for help, and so um, if you... If yeah, the you're, subtle hint. Pending, subtle hint. Uh, <laughs> so, so of course, financial resources. So if, if, if you do have some uh, interest in helping us, there's, there's ways to do that, and I'll, I can talk to you afterwards. Um, okay, just from acknowledgments um, to our lab... Um, uh, David Silberswag and Emily Stern direct the lab and to all the people there, the Impact Foundation who supported some of the work that we were doing, the Shenzhen, and uh, thanks to you guys. Uh, thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks. 
So that was pretty heady. Um, this is going to be more for fun. Um, I am going to uh, frame what we've done, these results, um, within the broad sweep of human history. Um, <laughs> uh, first, I'd like to say a little bit more about blobology. I would like you to uh, learn that word. That's actually a useful word to know. Um, it's a word that professional neuroscientists use among themselves to remind themselves how primitive our current state of neuroscience is. Okay, we show you these colored blobs, and it, it creates an impression in the general public that we know a lot more than we actually know. Um, and maybe that's okay, it creates sizzle and so forth. But the one thing that I learned getting involved in this field, uh, sort of not being professionally trained, but sort of entering it from the side, um, is uh, how really, uh, you have to just sort of lower the bar, okay? And really realize we're just starting. There is a huge potential in this kind of research, but I notice that when I talk to people about this research, they sort of nod their head and say, oh yeah, as though, oh well, of course you could show these uh, stunningly, statistically um, <clears throat> credible results. Well, yeah, of course there would be changes in the brain that you could see. People don't realize how hard it is to actually demonstrate that. Um, but, so, uh, uh, I just want to mention that. We're just at the, at the beginning of something that could revolutionize the course of human history. But we are just starting. And I think that the results that uh, we got are a significant um, contribution to this worldwide endeavor that's going on. And I think uh, <laughs> will be an important uh, zeitgeist for the 21st century. So I just wanted to say that uh, <clears throat> off uh, at first. So um, a number of years ago, I went to uh, Harvard Medical School, Dave's lab, and I, I gave them a pitch. Some of you may know in the entertainment industry what, it's, what it means to give a pitch. Uh, you, you give a presentation and you try to convince someone that they should uh, uh, get involved in what you have to offer. So, I gave them a pitch. I said, <clears throat> I've designed a, a system of practice that's based on mindfulness, but broadly draws from the whole of human contemplative history. And um, I designed it specifically to be convenient for scientific research. And I think that if you use this system, you will get um, uh, stunningly uh, uh, impressive results and perhaps novel results. Um, the head of the lab, uh, uh, Dr. Silberswag, sort of sat me down and said, well, you know, um, we might not get any results, and we, or if we get the results, they might be the results you don't want, <laughs> and we're going to still publish them. Um, and I said, well, of course, because that's the only way that science uh, can work. And when we started, to tell you the truth, if uh, it had turned out that we got no results, I would not have been surprised in the slightest. I would not have been surprised at all. I am actually quite surprised that we got this, this good results. That's how hard it is to get good results in this field. So, you know, broadly speaking, that's the, the significance. So, uh, let me see here. Um, this is my little presentation. Uh, I call it Divide and Conquer, Structuralism uh, Revisited. Now, a lot of people don't like this phrase, divide and conquer, it sounds sort of imperialistic, but I love it. Um, the Buddha discovered divide and conquer. 
if you can break down the elements of, um, that, uh, that produce self moment by moment, you could use the five skandhas, the four uh, uh, material elements, the four foundations of mindfulness. There are numerous uh, canonical deconstructions of selfhood. But if you can break the sense of self down into its components, um, you can uh, see uh, you will conquer suffering and the screwed up behavior that comes through suffering. So um, this, uh, this is just the phrase I like to use if you find this offensive. Uh, then you can substitute the phrase untangle and be free <laughs> um, for the phrase divide and conquer. So we're going to go down a little um, journey down uh, the pathway of history. Uh, starting here, here we are. You've seen this picture before. We didn't co correlate our shows too well, but uh, we start here. Uh, we're doing research that we just uh, presented to you. Why are we doing this? Well, we're doing this because uh, several decades ago, uh, expert first persons, that is to say expert observers from the inside, introspection uh, experts, started to dialogue with um, experts in a third person approach. A third person approach means, well, what's going on uh, neurophysiologically in your brain? So the reason we're doing this is that in the late uh, 20th century, um, this started. So here's Richie Davidson dialoguing with the Dalai Lama, third, uh, third person expert, first person expert, you could see some obvious chemistry. <laughs> um, and there's dialoguing going on here. So we're able to do this because the Mind and Life Institute created, they, they were clever. They got a celebrity and they created sizzle around the notion of the science, contemplative dialogue, third person, best of the West, first person introspection, best of the East, what's going to happen if they could cross fertilize, what kind of children will be born. I would say that right now the they're sort of seriously dating. Uh, <laughs> that's where we are historically. We'll see where this leads. So now, what preceded the late 20th century was the mid 20th century. This paradigm dominated. This is called behaviorism. There's B.F. Skinner, torturing pigeons. Here's John Watson, uh, messing around with the baby. Um, <laughs> So this was behaviorism, mid-20th century, dominant paradigm. <coughs> these people, react. so in a sense, we're reacting to them, but these people reacted to their predecessors, who were these people here, the founding fathers and mothers of uh, depth psychology, Freud, Adler, Jung, Reich, Klein, Hornei, etc., this was a dominant paradigm at an earlier period. Somewhat contemporaneous, but also somewhat preceding these people historically. Most people know the, this name. They would know this name. But behind these people are names that people no longer remember, but I think really had a lot to say. Um, these people particularly this person here, Edward Titchener, who started something called structuralism. Behind Titchener was Wilhelm Wundt, who started the first uh, uh, psychological laboratory. You can see he was born in 1832, so we're really going you know, back in history. And Wundt studied with one of the towering uh, uh, physicists of uh, <clears throat> uh, the 19th century, Hermann von Helmholtz. So this is hard, hard science. Now, he wanted to take a hard-nosed look. He was not a psychoanalyst type, okay? But he wanted to uh, look uh, in a very scientific way at experience. His protege was Titchener. I'm going to talk more about him. 
Titchener is, re is not remembered much. Uh, if you look in the history of psychology, he's remembered for starting something called structuralism, which is usually characterized as a dead end. Um, he's also remembered for giving out the first PhD in psychology to a woman uh, when women were not given degrees and he had to buck the culture of uh, Victorian world, Margaret Washburn got her PhD in psychology from Titchener. Um, and um, everyone knows the word empathy. Most people don't know it was coined by Edward Titchener, that, that word. So um, uh, what was the idea uh, that uh, Titchener had um, and also Wundt proceeding well, they said, how did we go? Let's look at the history of science. I, I'm a big advocate that scientists should carefully study the history of science. So they, that's what they did. They said, OK, how did we go from alchemy? Here we have alchemy. Uh, this is like 16th century stuff, which was sort of a pseudoscience. Um, here's the elements according to one uh, alchemical system. It's very archetypal, um, but not really much grounded in uh, uh, physical experiment. It's not quantified at all. Uh, <clears throat> I could go on and on. This is a very interesting uh, chart. Um, uh, but this is the paradigm, not a very good uh, analysis of, um, of the material world from our modern point of view. And this was the way of working. It was semi-magical. He's holding torches, trying to manipulate uh, cosmic forces. It's great for religion, but maybe not so good for uh, hard science. So people like Wundt and Titchener asked themselves, well, how did we go from um, alchemy to chemistry? So now I'm going to show you a slide that will contrast with alchemy. I'm going to show you a modern chemistry lab, you may <laughs> recognize the cultural uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, homage. So how did this, how did this trans, uh, transition happen? Well, it happened because of this. Mendeleev and others created this really good grid that, uh, I mean, I could go on and on about this, uh, just how much is in here. But this is a quantified and dimensionally uh, independent divide and conquer. You've divided it into elements and, uh, and you're exploring the relationship between the elements. And lo and behold, you go from this uh, <clears throat> uh, confusing uh, uh, plethora of uh, of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of substances, now millions of substances, to a, a pretty simple picture. So <clears throat> uh, Titchener said, OK, let's figure out the basic components of sensory experience, and then we'll be able to understand how self arises. And they took as their metaphor uh, the transition from alchemy to chemistry. So. <clears throat> Titchener had uh, his sort of periodic table of sensory elements. I'm not going to have time to go into this, but here he is. And here's sort of how he organized things, uh, uh, qualities versus elements here. It almost sort of looks like uh, the periodic table a little bit. <clears throat> uh, an amazing uh, amount of, uh, uh, <clears throat> or there are an amazing number of uh, similarities between how he decided to break things up and how I ultimately decided to break things up, uh, which is, I find, sort of interesting. OK, so <clears throat> Titchener had this. He called it structuralism. Um, <clears throat> but he was not the first person to come up with this notion. Not at all. Who was the first person to come up with this notion? <clears throat> Okay, a long, long time ago. I, I pulled this off of the, uh, of the Wikipedia. This is from Bhikkhu Bodhi's book. It's uh, the Abhidhamatta Sangaha, uh, where you have the five aggregates here and 
you've got the uh, <clears throat> 12 ayatanas, the, you've got the, uh, the five uh, skandhas, uh, <clears throat> you've got the uh, indriyas, you've got a total of uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, the, uh, these dharmas or ultimate realities, uh, etc., etc. So um, this is another periodic table of uh, sensory experience. So the Buddha was the first to come up with this notion of uh, uh, that it would be useful to break things down into their components, that you would get insights from untangling these elements. So there's the Abhidharma table of sensory elements. So based on what I knew about uh, how uh, functional uh, uh, neuroimaging and neuro uh, research was done, I created my own uh, version of all of this, and <laughs> that's me. Uh, yes, I like being in the company of those people. Uh, so um, we could go on and on about this, but we won't in detail. It's, by the way, all of this is on the internet, uh, on YouTube, and on uh, f free uh, uh, articles all over the internet, so you can see that. So this is basically what I pitched to the uh, Brigham and Women uh, Harvard Medical School Neural Lab. That, hey, if you use uh, this system, you're going uh, it, it to, uh, it might help you. So um, Einstein said something very interesting. He said, true human worth uh, uh, is measured by the magnitude and direction of liberation from self. Now, something that has magnitude... Yeah, this is an authentic Einstein quote, by the way. Uh, okay. So, he's imp implying that self is a kind of vector. Uh, that it, it has components. And that's what a periodic table of elements of self uh, do. So, I'm not going... Uh, I am not going to have time to actually do any of this, unfortunately as cool as it is, because we're running sort of late. Uh, well, actually, maybe I have more time, right? Because I have 12 minutes. Okay, well, <laughs> I'm going to run through it. <clears throat> Listen, Dave's presentation was so great. If you just got that, you got your money's worth. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so Titchener... Um, had this great idea, divide and conquer. We'll find a periodic table of sensory elements, and then we'll be able to make a true science of psychology, a true science of sensory experience, a true science of thought, emotion, and human happiness. Um, now, I think he was on the right track. For one thing, it maps onto Buddhism. I doubt that he knew that. Um, <clears throat> But it's always cited as a, a dead end and a failure. And here's the reasons, whoops, sorry, why it's cited as such. It failed to produce measurable outcomes. It failed to produce a simple model. It failed to produce means of helping people. Training informants was difficult. And informants sometimes did not agree on their experience. So it seems to me that we have two things available now to us that uh, Wundt and Titchener would not have had in uh, the Victorian and Edwardian age. What we have available now is the beginning of high-resolution neuroimaging technology. You notice I said the beginning. Uh, but our ability to image brain function grows and grows and grows. Year by year, decade by decade, our real-time uh, 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 movies of the of this is your brain on this this is your brain on that. Our movies are ge are getting better and better. Uh, they're not very great now, but they're they're blobology now. But it will improve. So we have neuroimaging technology, and the other thing we have is a knowledge of Buddhist practice and similar practices, mindfulness. Uh, so I would claim that uh, what we did at Harvard is in the lineage of these pioneers, these pre-Freudian pioneers uh, at the very uh, origin of uh, the Western study of consciousness, these people that wanted to be rigorously scientific 
and took the periodic table of elements as their model, I think we're in a position to vindicate their basic approach because we live in a different age. And so this is the advent of mindfulness in the West and the advent uh, and the ever improving neuroimaging is going to allow us to address each one of these failings and perhaps uh, uh, correct it and grow from it. So let's take these failings one at a time. Fail to produce measurable outcomes, well you just saw some pretty impressive measurable outcomes. That's what our neuro neuroimaging allows for. Um, Okay, uh, didn't have a simple model. Well, here's a simple model. <laughs> this is the one that I use. Pretty simple, you can see interactions between these elements that uh, explain, remember I said appreciate self and world. Here's your appreciation of the world. Here's your appreciation of the self. Mental image, mental talk, emotional body sensations, the uh, causal arrows, the relationships go back and forth. This stuff can trigger this stuff. So that's a fairly simple model. Um, didn't help people? Well, <laughs> mindfulness-based everything <laughs> is definitely helping people. Um, um, training, was, the training of the observers was inefficient. Well, that's because they didn't know about this kind of stuff, that you could train people with posture and uh, uh, systematic focusing techniques, well, we now know that. And we can train the observers this way. Now, the next one is very interesting. Um, agreement. Um, between the invention of the microscope and a final ag agreement on the cell theory of life, 200 years passed. People looked through the awareness extending tools um, and argued about what they were seeing for almost two centuries before science came to a consensus. So I give you this as um, a kind of uh, optimistic uh, uh, example that we're just now beginning a real dialogue across uh, traditions. We're just now beginning. And so in 200 years, we may have a consensus science of enlightenment. May. I'm not saying necessarily will, but could happen. So, whose paradigm? Look at here. You must realize your true self, Ramana Maharshi. I totally agree with him. You must realize there truly is no self, the Buddha. I totally agree with him. <laughs> now, this, this is sort of messed up, but uh, <clears throat> you must sweat tears and piss blood. That's the Zen approach. That's the Sakyamuni <laughs> Uh, here you have Papaji saying, call off the search. <laughs> so is it about sweating tears and pissing blood or calling off the search? I agree with him, and I agree with him, 100%. So that's 400% four, so agreement on paradigm. <laughs> Who's, whose stages? The 1750 koans, uh, <clears throat> the 10 bodhisattva levels, the four... Of, Five ranks, the uh, ten oxerting pictures, it's not a hundred, uh, the slide got messed up, the 16 stages of insight, um, the five paths, it's in Tibetan practice. Well, this is starting to dialogue too because these path models apparently seem similar but very different. So here's what I think about agreement. Um, the combination of a lot of people doing these techniques um, with our ability to have objective, observe objective correlates based on the subjective reports, plus this frank and collegial uncensored dialogue that is exemplified by what happens at Buddhist Geeks. I have the uh, Dharma Overground website here. Uh, people really talking about what they're really experiencing. Here's the Dalai Lama and the Trappist monk. Getting down to the nitty gritty. This is not a theological discussion. This is a discussion about what happens to us when we practice. I would think that a combination of a lot of people doing powerful techniques plus some objective way to, um, to sort of uh, uh, validate or 
disconfirm people's subjective claims, plus this kind of dialoguing could solve the agreement among informants problem that was said to be one of the uh, dead ends of, um, of structuralism. So these are the reasons why I think there, it's, there's a basis for optimism. And um, I'm going to have to unfortunately skip that. This is a uh, pictorial representation of the system that I teach. We already went over this, didn't we? Three goals. You work with your, your sensory experience, what you see, inner and outer, what you hear, inner and outer, what you experience in your body emotionally and physically. Um, I teach, uh, and you apply concentration, clarity, and equanimity. That's my definition of mindful awareness. So you bring mind, this is the overall paradigm of the basic mindfulness system. You bring concentration, clarity, and equanimity to your inner and outer visual, auditory, and somatic experiences. Um, I have three basic strategies for doing that. Noting, do nothing, and nurture positive. Uh, noting is noting from the Mahasi tradition. Uh, do nothing is, as I said, uh, a sort of knockoff on choiceless awareness. And um, <laughs> nurture positive is a vast generalization of loving kindness practice. So these are four, three basic approaches. These are three basic skills. That's why I call it basic mindfulness. There's basis vectors here. Um, and so, uh, and it has three characteristics. I wanted to create a system that was science friendly. Differential equation uh, iconically represents that. I wanted to create a system that was interactive and algorithmic so that you could be coached through automated uh, software or live coaching, but it was real-time interactive. I found that that was the best way to teach and support people in their practice. Uh, the usual paradigm is, um, here's the mudra, here's the posture, here's the cushion, there's the wall, go face it, come back <laughs> in an hour or a day or two. But I found that uh, touching base every three or four minutes um, was a much more effective way uh, to both teach and support people in practice. So, uh, sorry. <laughs> so that's an algorithm, and I wanted it to produce. Um, I wanted it to produce the classic results, not to be watered down in the slightest. I'm one of those people that is comfortable talking about stream entry, enlightenment. I'm not afraid of the E word, etc. Um, so those are some of the. Uh, salient features of the system represented as a kind of mandala. So will, do, will, technolog will science, technology, interacting with spirituality, uh, what, will that produce a, um, uh, a, um, a kind of radical change for the better on the planet? Um, it's possible. Um, but we also have to be honest. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that something uh, <clears throat> uh, dramatic and good and fast and global could happen as the result of this cross-fertilization, but we can't say for sure. Um, it's a, you'll remember, um, uh, you may remember the thing about... Um, uh, uh, you, I've got two pills, the red pill and the blue pill, you know. Um, so uh, we can't say for sure where this is going to end. Uh, but I'm going to be advocating that we take the red pill here um, and um, explore this. And we're done. That's it. Thank you.